And welcome to the Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. Brought to you in part by Far North Tactical over there at the corner of 8th and Lacey. And also by Bighorn Enterprises. Well, you know what? I always enjoy when people start taking ownership, when people are like, you know what? This is an idea that I can wrap my mind around. This is something that I personally believe in. And my own son, David, 14 years old, brought to my attention a video, which the guys here thought would be appropriate to share the audio from, about the government. Gather around. I'm here to give you anything you like. You want free college, energy, mortgages, (laughs) whatever you like. You have come to the right place. Why? I'll tell you why. Who can take your money? Who can take your money? With a twinkle in their eye. A twinkle in their eye. Take it all away and give it to some other guy. The government. The government. The government can. The government can. Who can tax the sunrise? Who can tax the sunrise? Who can tax the trees? Who can tax the trees? Let your run. I think we get the point of it. If you'd like to look that up on YouTube, you can by either going out, uh, doing a search on Tim Hawkins or simply the words the government can. Thanks, David, for sharing that with me. And uh, thanks, Josh and Dave Giesel, for helping me to uh, get that on the air this morning. Joining us in the studio, of course, Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises and also from the, well, now you're just an unaffiliated anarcho-capitalist, which, you know, that that is, in and of itself is fun to say. Dave Giesel, thanks for being here this morning. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I mean, say, I don't know if I heard you very well. Say that again. Say something. Thanks, Steve. All right, that's better. Oh, he's loud and clear. Good enough. Well, you know what? I, I, the message is loud and clear that uh, if you think differently from what the government tells us the solutions should be, then we're wrong. It's dangerous to be right when the government's wrong, something like that. <laughs> well, it, exactly. I mean, is there a particular issue this morning that you have on tap, ready to go? Well, last week we, uh, I thought, had a pretty good show on discussing the impossibility of limited government. I don't know if we want to want to recap on. Should we recap sure. on that? Yeah. yeah, go for it. So, we, uh, you know, most folks that uh, I know or whatever, they want this uh, fallacy called small government, and they like to. I don't know. They basically like to talk about all the great things that we, we would have if we had a limited small government. And last week we talked about the impossibility of that happening. It's impossible to have a small government because eventually, I mean, if you look at the, the U.S., the way it started out was probably the, the best it could have, except for the fact they had it better before they started <laughs> their constitution and their democracy or whatever it was supposed to be. The republic. I mean, before they had their republic, they had non-states, a bunch of citizens, uh, colonists who just had nothing to be loyal to except for their neighbor. They had militias that were fighting for their neighbor. They had no state they were fighting for. They had no country they were fighting for. They, they had an ideal that they were fighting for. It's called liberty. And unfortunately, they decided, hey, you know, this worked out so good. Let's have a government. So they screwed <laughs> some people, themselves. Some, some people said right, that. Right. <laughs> Several they, said no. And they, uh, yeah, they had a little coup and nobody agreed on anything. And then they told everybody that they agreed. And uh, so it was forced on them right on the very, <laughs> very beginning. <laughs> and so the concept was we're going to have this limited government that has all these checks and balances and. The biggest problem was that everyone could be in government. You know, you can anyone can grow up and be president, which is a terrible thing because that means any scumbag that wants to steal from someone can get enough people 
or enough other scumbags that want him to get in and steal from people to give to them can be in government now. And that's exactly what we have. We have a whole pile of people in Juno who are scumbags that want to rule over you or steal your property, and they're allowed to, instead of looking down on it like it used to be, like, ugh, you want to steal property? You want, you, uh, what's the word? Envy your neighbor's property or whatever? So <laughs> that used to be looked that look down Is that upon. The word? Covered, covered? Yeah. You have covered, you know? You'd have covered. look down on that, right? And you'd be like, oh, you know, why do you want to steal from people? No, now we have government where it's like, it's encouraged. It's looked well upon. That's, look at that man. My, can you believe how much he's brought to our state? <laughs> Decades of public service. What would we do if we didn't have all of those earmarks right, right, for right. bridges that no one will use, so, except for those who have property on that island? Well, even if they're going to use it, that that they don't want to pay for themselves. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you can uh, a thief might make good use of the money he steals, but that doesn't make it right. Oh, no, no, no. Hang on a second. How is it not right? I, I mean, think about it. If, 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 if we all decide that we really, really, really want flowers on Airport Way, then it seems to me that it is perfectly logical that we should take a vote to decide to go and take the money from somebody who doesn't want flowers on Airport Way to pay for it. Yeah. How is that not right? So the, so the bottom line is, as long as you have this system where people can be put into power to steal from someone else, well, it automatically wants to sustain itself, so it's going to grow. No matter how small it starts, I don't think there's any way to keep it small because you have to you have to go into government to make it smaller. So more people yeah. have to get into it because, well, well, the bad guys are in, like Randy says all the time, well, if we don't get other guys to run against the communists, then we'll all be communists. <laughs> so it forces good people who... Otherwise, have no desire to steal from other people. They have to go into government. No, they they actually can't get in. Right? Yeah, they usually can't. But they're they're forced to spend a lot of time and money mm -hmm. and waste. Well, that's only because they buy there. into this this idea that somehow the only solution is to buy into the game. I guess that 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 is being played. A better way to say that would be that they're subject to it, whether they approve or not. Right. Um, what Hans Hoppe says is um, he talks about free entry into the ruling class, you know, which is what it is. And uh, he says when you when you have free entry into the ruling class, um, anybody can get their hands on the mechanism of, of the state, right, the me mechanism of theft and the monopoly on the use of force. And so what kind of people is that going to attract? You know, are you going to get a lot of Mennonites and Amish and people like that, you know, running for the right to steal from people and, and wage war? You know, probably not. Um, you're probably going to get people who desire the power to run. And so it's going to create its own problems from that, right? You're going to get power-hungry people running for power. Um, furthermore, in order to win an election, a popular election, in this free entry to the ruling class, uh, the there's this idea that everybody's, you know, everybody can run, everybody has an equal chance, you know, and people say, oh, we need campaign finance reform, so everyone has a fair chance to get into government. Well, what about somebody who stutters? Do you think they have an equal chance as somebody who's more eloquent in getting into government? No. Heck no. So there, Hoppe points out that there is a um, certain number of traits that uh, give you asymmetry in entry to the political class. So if you have certain physical and, um, and uh, character traits, it's a lot easier for you to get elected. Like if you don't have a moral conflict lying to people, you're going to have a lot easier time getting into government because you can promise people whatever they want and then just change your mind about it later and you don't have an internal conflict you're okay with that so it tends to attract those kind of people versus and he, he compares it to uh first he compares it to uh monarchy just because that's what it's supposedly better than and then he compares it to a uh, a um private law society as he calls it which he says is, is uh superior but just in contrast to monarchy you don't have free entry into the ruling class in monarchy. You have to either be born into the ruling class or marry in. And uh, one, of, one of his assertions is that, well, at least if the, uh, if the leader is selected by birth, there's a chance you're going to get somebody who's not a power-hungry liar, right? There's a chance that the king's kid will actually be a decent kid and not want to uh, kill and steal as much as possible in as short a time frame as possible, you know, Maybe, probably not, right? Because mm -hmm. he's born, you know, into this privilege, but maybe not. 
you know, there's at least a chance. It's like it's a crapshoot. <laughs> Whereas when you have an election and you distill out all the people who are principled because their views aren't mainstream, because they don't lie to the maximum number of people, when you distill all those people out systematically, which is what a democracy does, there's no chance of getting somebody who is, um, you know, ethically sound and uh, and these things. Zero. I, yeah. I when uh, listening to him talk about that, he says. To be elected, you basically need to be able to speak well. You need to have lots of money. You need to be good looking and all that, you know, suave and everything. I've lost twice, so what's that say? <laughs> that ticked me off. <laughs> need, to, well, need, to, need to take up a new hairstyle for yeah. the third time you run. Well, I like Romney, so I'm going to go with that. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's got very political hair. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but you also have facial hair, Josh, and you know the, uh, the odds are not in your favor if you have facial hair. What People about know? Lincoln? Well, that That's what was, I was going for. That was what? Uh, you need that. That was like a million years ago. <laughs> yeah, I think it, I think weird hats and politicians go together. I'm just gonna throw that idea out there. <laughs> you know what you, what you need is one of those one of those beanie caps with a little whirl, twirly bird on top. That would be that would get you right up there to the top. I, well, you know, anytime you have a mob that gets to decide what they want based on who they put in charge of the of the mob, you're gonna have. A, a bad scene. I mean, you look at it throughout history. I mean, this does require some reading. This does require some, you know, not just simply taking the propaganda and the pablum that's being fed to the masses off the uh, the TV and radio and other media sources, but actually do some reading and find some old history and look at what happened in Rome. Look at what happened in Nazi Germany. Look what happened in the uh, the different colonies here in the United States. And and look at whatever happens any time. You turn power over to people who, at their own core, do not are, are not capable of self-control and making moral choices on their own. Well, they should never be given that choice in the first place, at least not over other people. Exactly. If they want to have that little problem on their own, then other people can take care of that. But once they're in government, they have this little thing called monopoly on force and guns, and they get to... Decide. Well, look at, I mean, look at even in the colonies. What did we have here up and down the east coast of the United States? What, what became the United States? Colonies. You've got, you know, right, in the colonies, you've got the Puritans in, in the north uh, east. They're up by Massachusetts. And what was their colony like? Basically, Puritan scumbags. Well, I mean, the, 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 it's a lot like the United States today. A lot like the United Highly States. Highly violent, right very, socialistic, very coercive. Very, very conservative. Very oh, yeah. reminiscent of the conservative Republican or Party else. Right. It's conservative. It, exactly. Or else. It was based <laughs> on this idea of we know what's right morally, and if you do not conform to our moral code, you will be punished. You'll be killed. Killed. Drast- those people. Oh, well, they, no, some they, places they just cut off your nose. Well, they would dra- They would put you in a cart right in the middle of winter, strip you naked, tie you to a cart, and then drag you through a town, and then drag you over to the next town, drag you to another town, drag you to another town. The whole time you're dragging behind this cart to show you didn't conform to their moral code, <laughs> which is so much like the conservative Republican Party today because they they don't actually drag you through. They just throw you in a cage. It's a lot more efficient, apparently. Well, I mean, you look at what, what goes on, though, in the media. Look at what happens to people like Ron Paul in the media. They get... From the Republican side. Yeah. Well, it's a good show, right? Yeah. It shows me who they are. Look at uh, anyone in Juneau or over here at the borough. We'd have to... I think we could exclude Natalie Howard... They're all scumbags, all of them. Every single one of them is a treacherous scumbag. They've not done one thing. I mean, even if we want to uh, accept this oath of office and all this and that, I mean, it makes you even, at least me, even more angry because not only they don't have a clue what their oath of office means, but they sure heck is never, they've never followed it. They've never kept it. So they're, what good are they? They're scumbags. We've said that since uh, this is like the this is the one year anniversary for Patriots <laughs> yeah. Lament, and we've been asking for a whole year now. What good are our state representatives? They're just what have they stopped? What didn't we uh, yesterday or the day before we had uh, a bill in the Senate, the National Senate, where they decided to uh, it was Rand Paul put it an amendment into some bill where um, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, could not be armed, and it failed. 
<laughs> drastically failed. Only seven people voted for that amendment. The Those raw milk amendment. farmers, you got to be, when you're confiscating their milk and putting them in jail, watch out. I mean, they might dump a bucket of milk on you, so you got to be ready to well, those are the Amish, blow their they're head they're off. Aren't they? I mean, the Amish, they're right up there with, like, Timothy McVeigh. Yeah. Oh, they're loaded for... Remember that armed Amish revolt that happened <laughs> ever? Remember that one? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So wait, wait, wait. And load. It wasn't just the armed Amish revolt. Remember back in uh, I don't remember what year it was, but when the Amish actually took over New York City, when they went in there and they and they drove out all of the people. Oh, you should have read what they did to Massachusetts. They tried to get rid of them, and they just kept coming back. <laughs> yeah. So they kept killing them. <laughs> they'd kill <laughs> they them. They'd just walk away. And then they'd come back. And then they'd, they'd come back, and again. they'd kill them again. But I think the more to the point with. Uh, this deal with the FDA, they want these people armed. They I want, think the want, idea of leaving is better and better every day. Even your food and drug people now. And it's always been good. It just looks better and better. Yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> it looks better and better every day. So, But how long until that door is closed on them? It's already, if you don't pay your taxes, they revoke your passport. Yeah. Yeah. I think... Yeah, we got a couple of lines on hold here. Four, five, eight. Before Aaron changes my subject. Talk. Basically, now, for the last year, we have come to the conclusion, and I don't think anyone has come close to making our point. I don't know. I, I don't think anyone has proved us wrong yet. The best solution is no state. There is no such thing as limited government. There is no such thing as a good, limited government. It will never happen. So, the only choice is, the correct choice is no state. Yeah, um, you know, depending on your premise. So, I, I would... Well, yeah, I, that's I, a good point. I, I would agree with that, but <laughs> one of the interesting things that I've I've recently realized, and, and we talked about this on last week's show, was there are people who say that theft is wrong, and murder is wrong, and uh, putting somebody in a cage for doing something to their own body with their own body is wrong. And so they say no state because the state violates all that. And then there's the people who say, well, you know, I really uh, I hate the IRS. I want my taxes to be lower, but we have to tax somebody to pay for this. They And, and th- those people are not actually philosophically the same. The guy who says he wants less, but that it's necessary is agreeing that some systematic theft is necessary. He says theft is okay, right? He says murder is okay. Um, you know, well, how are we? How would we provide for national defense? Who's going to steal our children and and you know throw them to the uh, the fodders of war? Um, so th- they're taking the same position as the people who say we need a 90% tax on the rich. The people who say we need, you know, we need a 15% flat tax, and that's how we're going to fund the government and make it more efficient. They're taking the same philosophical position as the people who say we need a 90% tax on the rich, soak the rich, which is that theft is okay. They stand on the same premise. Yeah. And the people who say that theft is not okay and it's not right no matter who's doing it, um, which would be, you know, us in, in this studio and several other people out there. We're actually taking a fundamentally different philosophical position. So wait, wait, what you're, what you're saying, Dave, just to make sure that I've got this correctly here, is that if somebody comes up and sticks a gun in your back and takes a dollar out of your wallet and gives you back the wallet, is fundamentally no different than a person who comes up and sticks a gun in your back and takes every single dollar out of your wallet. Right. You would you would obviously prefer that they take less, right? If they have to take it at all. Sure. If you were faced with the option of uh, of having one dollar or a hundred dollars stolen, you would prefer that they take less. But it's the same thing, right? You're not voluntarily exchanging. You're you're being robbed, right? At the threat of being killed or locked in a cage. And so if, and if they take that money and they go and they buy something nice for somebody else, like some old lady, that, give them matter. a free ride someplace with the money that they stole, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. Doesn't what, matter. If they, what if they plant flowers with well, that I mean, money? you know, g- good for them. You know, that's that's great, but that's a separate uh, that's a separate issue. You know, they've stolen from you. And the problem is that it's gone on for so long. It's like, what if... Uh, yeah, people that it's just accept it as right. a so we, we want status quo thing. We want the less part. It's like what if maybe somebody, they'll just take the dollar and then it's okay. But the problem is we've said it's okay yeah, to the, take that dollar. That is the problem. And so well that's the philosophical position is that it's okay. And so, you know, these limited government people out there 
That's great. You know, if they're comfortable with that position, that's terrific. But they are philosophically no different than the totalitarian government people. They take, they stand on the same basis, which is that theft and murder. murder and all of these things are are fundamentally okay. It's just how much do we want to have? How much how much systemic murder is okay? How much systemic theft is okay? That's what they're arguing. They're just arguing degrees. So I, I'm getting I'm getting little remnants of the Hunger Games. We my wife and I finally saw the movie a couple of weeks ago, and it, it just little little bits there. Well, well, instead of having full scale war, we're just going to go out and make you sacrifice. Yeah, a, let's couple, just send, a couple of your kids. Send some kids. Well, you know, which may be fine and dandy for the, the people whose kids are not the ones being selected. Mm-hmm. But if it's your child being murdered, I mean, what about the, the, the couple whose kid was abducted 30-some years ago and they just finally got the guy? You know, mm-hmm. the, the very first kid on the milk carton was in the news this week? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah what, g- gee, it was only one kid that was kidnapped and murdered. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's... Uh, Our lines are loaded up, by the way. I think it comes... what. What just reminded me, the last thing you said here with the the minarchists, the small, limited government, the basic, I've been listening to this deal, and it's on our website with Brett Rothbard, the basic, the fundamental difference is, and the, the art, the ever, the, the fundamental question, thank you, is, do you hate the state? Mm-hmm. That's no, you, it. Right. Uh, yeah. Is... And the state, the state being, you know, the institution of uh, of theft and and murder and right. expropriation. Do you do you have a fundamental problem with that, or is it okay? And it just depends on, you know, how badly they're screwing certain people. Is or, that or who's in charge? Because I mean, if you, right. if you know, as long as they're murdering and killing and well, that's I guess the same thing, isn't it? Uh, imprisoning and yeah, taking Aaron people from you know as somebody from the other party, then it's okay. Four five eight talk is a number. You ready? I think Aaron's the hotline. Nope. Oh, that. Oh. Uh, all right. How are you? Here we go. We got a winner. Good morning. Hey. Who's this? This me. Yeah, I might be. Depends on who you are. Right. Well, a lot of beeping going on there. It got lost. What's your first name? <laughs> this is Mike in Norfolk. Mike, thanks for calling in. What's on your mind? Yeah, you're speaking of taxes. Just had an idea that why don't the citizens that pay taxes of each state send it to the governor, and then each governor, they can have an annual meeting, and the federal government submits them a budget of what they need, and they vote on what parts they're willing to fund with their citizens' money. And that way, if you don't like it, you can vote the governor out and get the next one in. Don't we already do that? No, not really, because right now we well, we send senators and representatives to Washington. Oh, you're saying just to, and then we send our money be to the governor. That we that, send our money to the IRS, and which we have no, really no say where it goes. So basically, you're still saying fundamentally that it's okay to take money away from people. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> no, I believe our government. I do not mind paying taxes somewhat. Right, so that's now, what, what that's we're paying fine, right now is outrageous. That's totally right, and that's um, that's fine. You know. Uh, I, I've been called worse things. And so that's cool, but um, that's no different. You're not taking a fundamentally different position than, uh, you know, your average Obama supporter or any of those people. You're taking the same philosophical position, which is, well, we need to do certain things to certain people, and the only way that uh, we should go about it is through theft. Do you think and stealing's okay? This country takes money to run. Um, so, um, that's, but that's a different question. Yeah. That's a different the, question. The, the, I mean, the, the mafia, the the mafia requires from? money to run. Um, the gangs in in town, the, they take money to run. Um, so really, the fundamental question is: Do you think theft is okay? I think Josh nailed it. Is theft okay ever? Okay, so if no taxes are collected from anywhere, nope. the- different different question. You we're we're asking. We're not asking a technical question. This is a philosophical Mike, question. Can Can you answer that question? It's, it is theft okay. Well, of course not. That's a okay. So, um, you know. so that's cool. So yeah. we've we've said theft is not okay, and so now let's try and uh, square that with taxation. How do you uh, rectify that? I, I'm just curious because I can't rectify it myself. What's the option? So you're making a pragmatic decision, not a moral decision, right? You're saying, well, theft isn't okay, but. Uh, uh, I don't want to pay for the stuff that I want, and so I'm going to have to steal from somebody. Fundamentally, it's the same question that they asked over slavery. Well, who's going to pick the who's cotton? Who's going to pick the cotton? 
the options. We can't get rid of slavery because who's going to pick the cotton, Josh? Okay, well, come up with an alternative. Yeah, well, they, that was that was the fascinating thing about the abolition of slavery is um, there, there at the time at the time if you had told people in the South that uh, you know there were going to be these giant machines powered by this uh, this smelly liquid that burns really well and it's going to pick the cotton for them they would have told you you were nuts and yeah. what do we have today do we have are there people out picking cotton by hand certainly not in this country. And it wasn't until slavery was abolished and they were faced with that problem of, oh, my goodness, now how are we going to pick the cotton? That, yeah, they, found that a, they figured it a out. A more efficient way to do Necessity things. Necessity is right the mother of invention. We're up against the clock here. The Fox News coming your way. We'll be back with more of the Saturday morning wake-up call. All right, welcome back to the Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. Joining us now by phone, one of the other main sponsors of the program, it's uh, Aaron Bennett there with Far North Tactical. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. How you doing, guys? Man, how's it out there making cash money? Well, it'd be a lot better if I could keep all of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we need your money to do the things that we want to do, Aaron. So I mean, we have to. You have to give up some of your money to be able to for us to plant flowers on Airport Way and build. And what's the bike option, paths. Aaron? I mean, what would we do without it? I I do have a a question. Um, obviously, it's more than apparent that this form of government doesn't work. Fundamentally, it does, doesn't work. I mean, you have to look at what we have and realize where it's at. It doesn't work, right? Yeah, we agree with you, I would think. So, <laughs> I guess everybody always wants to know, well, how can it work? When the founders originally set it up, they set it up so only people that own property could vote, Right. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting uh, discussion right there. So I guess my question is, is if only property owners could vote, they would have a vested interest to only vote in people that owned property, right? Right. And people that owned property would have a vested interest in not taxing property because it, that would hurt themselves. Right. Yeah, you and I have had this discussion. How much longer? I mean, we came to the conclusion that ultimately it would still be we'd still be where we are now because it started out that way. But yeah, how well, much they, longer would it have drug itself out? The um, the merchants uh, were the ones who got taxed instead. Right. All right. Somebody still got taxed, mm-hmm. and that was mainly through uh, the commerce, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. But you didn't see this property tax thing going on no certainly and until they changed that everybody could vote but uh it's worth noting that everybody does pay property tax they just don't realize it i mean when you when you get a rental property and you're trying to positive cash flow it i mean you don't rent a property unless you're going to positive cash flow it good lord and uh, of course part of the cost of owning property is the tax and so renters and people on leases and all sorts of these things, uh, they are paying property taxes just rolled into their rent, so it's not right in their face. Right, and it's really interesting where you just said the merchants paid for the tax. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you, if you <laughs> look back into history, what's interesting is that guess where the merchants decided not to, to go, no, where they were taxed. taxed. Like New York was huge on taxing merchants, so they decided... Ultimately, even though eventually they had to go back to New York because they were killed, beaten up, their ships were burned or stolen. Actually, they were stolen a lot. They were mm-hmm. all of a sudden it was okay to go steal this guy's ship because he decided he didn't want to trade with you anymore because you were taxing him. Mm-hmm. So they would go to other colonies that didn't have that merchant tax. And guess what? There's like this thing called free trade, and they were saying, "I have something that you need." Well, I have something that you need. Mm-hmm. So they shared it back and forth, and those colonies were all of a sudden gaining wealth, and people were massively leaving the colonies they were in and going to those. That's the solution. When the guy said, what's the solution? <laughs> that was a solution. They didn't have – New Jersey didn't have a tax. East New Jersey, West New Jersey, no taxes. Zero. Right, they had no government. They just had a trade. And then, it seems like the more people that are involved in government, to me – the worse it gets. And we all lend legitimacy to everything that everybody in government does because we all see it as we all could be in that spot. Mm. Mm, 
Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Could get yeah. My, yeah. Wrap my hand around the gun of the state. And we're okay with who gets in there because we know in two years we can vote them out and put some be- someone better in there. So we're, that's why we go along with it, isn't it? Isn't that why we really go along with it? Because we have this hope that Ron Paul is going to be elected next time? <laughs> I mean, that's why we, that's why we keep fundamentally going after this this political solution because we think, well, dang it, I lost this one. But in two years or six years, Lisa Murkowski's gone, and I'm going to jo- vote in Joe Miller instead. Or <laughs> take, take your pick. Aaron Bennett. I think we should vote in Aaron Bennett this Senate. Well, the, the, it seems like the less amount of time that a guy can be in office, the worse he gets. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, yeah, he so, has a, he has a much less he has less time to steal, so he's got to like ramp it up. So right? things that things that we push for, like term limits and stuff like that, that seems like it exemplifies the problem <laughs> or amplifies. Sorry. Yeah, and and you get things. Uh, I mean, the, the people who are in government, uh, they get in some lobbying group, and then they they get elected. And they have, like, the special interest behind them. It's like, we're going to help you get elected so you can do this cool thing. Mm -hmm. And then they get out, and then they become, like, special advisors to, you know, X or Y lobbying group or corporation or whatever. And so even if they're only in for two years, even if you have term limits, the whole point is to prepare an agenda ahead of time, get inserted into the power structure and make that agenda law, and then get the reward on the other side. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You 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 know what you're sounding like right now is you're sounding like the state of Alaska putting somebody who, say, is a lobbyist for the oil companies, getting him into the second to the top spot as lieutenant governor, and then when the governor resigns, he becomes governor and then gets reelected, gets elected to that spot and has everybody on both sides of the aisle talking about how he's going to be the longest-serving governor in the history of the state. <laughs> I, I think I got a, I think I got a really good example though. Um, so Obama was in for four years, right? Yeah. And everybody is freaking out now that he might get another eight years, and they everybody oh. says, "All oh, right, you know what I mean, another four years." Everybody is claiming that he was being reserved in his agendas because he was hoping for another four years, right? So those same people are calling for term limits. Right. No, that's a good point. What you're saying is when they have less time and they see that their time is coming to an end, they work harder to push their agenda. All right. So it's, I, people is, come in and talk to me at, the, at my store there and talk about how we're screwed if Obama gets in because he was being reserved because he wanted another four years. And in the same breath, they say, this is why we need term limits. It totally blows my mind. If there was a... If, Obama only had four years to begin with, and that was it. He knew he only had four years. Wouldn't he have been worse? So the less amount of time that a guy's in government, the worse that he is. Yeah. So our, That's limited, another, so that, our limited government makes the evilest of people. That's another thing Hoppe points out, is the uh, the limited term uh, tends to increase their, uh, their time preference, because they can only, like an owner, you know, a king or somebody like this who owns the, the land that you know his fences around or whatever he owns what he can exploit now uh, but he's also going to own it you know next harvest season and the harvest season after that and the harvest season after that so if all of his uh feudal serfs if he wipes all of them out and they die in over the winter he's not going to have anybody to steal from the next year and so even though you know he's still stealing from people he has an incentive for the long-term health of his uh of his serfdom whereas uh, in a political structure the politician only has his hand on the uh, on the gun of the state while he's in office, so he has to focus his uh, expropriation into the term of office. Which is how you end up with a 40% of your wealth tax. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, if I can just uh, digress back here a minute ago, when that guy asked, what's your options? And nothing against him, because most people haven't thought out what our options would be. We, we've grown up in the system. Our grandparents have, our great-grandparents have, our parents have. There's no option in our mind. This is, I mean, we're taught from grade school on the Pledge of Allegiance, and this is the greatest country in the world, blah, blah, blah. Which it could be, minus the government, I would say this would be the greatest country in the world. Our, our uh, ability to create wealth is pretty amazing. So... Back in the colonial days, I'm going to go back to then, Philadelphia, the New Jerseys, East and West New Jersey, they had no government. They had no tax. They had no army. They 
did quite well. They were rich. People from all the other colonies were leaving wherever they were because they were getting taxed to death and going to those places. It can work. We're just afraid because it's outside of our known boundary. It's outside the box or whatever. So we don't want to go into that. Or like Steve always says, well, we're all like these sheep, and when a sheep gets out, we say, hey, bring him back, bring him back, because it's all we know. Sheep out of the pen. Quick, right. go get him, farmer. And it's basically a, uh, what's the syndrome? The Stockholm, Stockholm syndrome. syndrome. We can't think outside of our master. We love it. So I'm going to ask every, just to start it off right, every caller from now on, and I'll start with Aaron. Do you hate the state? Fundamentally, as an institution, I hate the state. Thank you. So let's go to a caller. All right. Aaron, you want to stay on the line? Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Let's make sure I got it right here. If I hang up on you, call back in, okay? Mm-hmm. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. All right. How about you? Good morning. You're next. Who's this? Are you there? All right. We're going to drop you. All right, gentlemen, we have cleared the lines effectively here. I would think maybe that question you threw out there was too high a bar. I huh? guess uh, none of them hate <laughs> <laughs> the state. Whoop. <laughs> uh, that's pretty effective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's hard, it's hard to hate the state because you you see the state as you. Every one of us can be involved of it, in it. Every one of us is part of it. How how do you hate the state? Excellent point. That is that is right on the money. That is why we hang on to it because we can be that person. We can vote in that person. We can have that limited government. I mean, aren't, aren't it's we a all chase. told from childhood that we could be the president of the United States? I, I'm thinking of Marlon Brando. Yeah, as if it's a good thing. Do you guys, you remember the Godfather, the original Godfather? Yeah, yeah, kind of Marlon Brando with the whole, you know, the cotton in his mouth. Mm-hmm. We'll make you an offer you can't refuse, right? Uh, you just imagine him thinking about his boys and how, you know, one of these, someday one of my boys is going to be in charge of the mafia. You know, and he tells his boys, all right, boys, one of these days, and who was it that ends up taking taking uh, advantage of his generosity? And actually, It's not even one of his own flesh and blood, but it's his adopted son, who's the one who ends up taking over the family business and making dad proud. I actually haven't seen that. Oh, really? Which is odd, but except for the difference is he would um, he wouldn't exploit everybody that works for him because he would want to hand that down to his kids. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a good point. Well, going back to do you hate the state when you have uh, even these guys that uh, you know we talk about the founding fathers and their foul, the, they they fundamentally made a mistake they made a constitution mm, i don't think they made a mistake right well the guys that forced it through correct <laughs> let's say they, they made a decision the, that we disagree with right exactly <laughs> the uh it was a mistake for us mm-hmm. but uh you had guys like uh patrick henry he was totally against it mm-hmm. completely 100% against that he wanted to keep what they had basically a non-state society he hated the state. Thomas Jefferson, I would say, the Jeffersonians, they hated the state. Sam Adams. Samuel Adams. He hated the state. So it's not something that's, oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know, it's not something we can be ashamed of. We can be proud of it. You can say, I fundamentally hate the state, the institution of the state, the institution that steals and kills. Yeah, I don't even I don't even need those guys to agree with me. I, you know, I just have no, this weird, I, I have this bizarre <laughs> premise that stealing and killing is wrong. Well. And for me, for me, that happens to actually make a difference in what I advocate, whether it's pragmatic or not. And, um, you know, so if, if I can see that I can make my life easier by stealing from somebody, I'm still not going to do it because I think it's wrong. And that's good enough for me. That's well, a good enough reason to disagree with the state. I agree with you. I'm reaching out to the, yeah, 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 the limited yeah. government constitutionalist. Right? Godspeed. <laughs> the guys that... No, exactly. Good luck. <laughs> right? The guys that we, that people tout, I mean, we do the 4th of July, we take the pledge, and we talk about the founding fathers and all this and that. Well, guess what? They, there's quite a few of them. Even the ones that wanted limited government because they didn't know anything else, basically. They hated the state. They hated the thought of an institution that could rule over your life. Wouldn't we have a lot better chance of limited government if only people that own the property could vote? But that's been ruled to be unconstitutional, Aaron. Well, yeah, and that's interesting because the reason it was is because not enough wealth 
was stolen to generate mm-hmm. funds for the people that ruled it unconstitutional. Mm-hmm. I mean, ultimately, if you're on the Supreme Court, what are you going to rule? You're not going to rule against yourself. You're going to rule for the monster because it feeds what? you. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to rule against a president that nominated you. You're not going to rule against a Senate that confirmed, confirmed you. Because they pay your salary every year. So who who's your allegiance to? And, and they can change things, too. I mean, wasn't it uh, FDR who reduced the number of Supreme Court justices? Were you Added. Yeah. Oh, he yeah. added. And he threatened to add more if he didn't get what he wanted. He said, I'll just pack the, sta- I'll just pack the court. Give me my fascism or give me death. Yeah. Basically what he said. Anyway. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hello. Hey, who is this? Cecily, good morning. What's on your mind today? Cecily, do you hate the state? Well, I, um, it's not so much the come on uh, the state that I I don't really hate anybody. But well, I, no, I'm not talking about a person. I'm talking about an institution. I I do um have an institution a, that stole from your brother. Yeah, I do have a big problem with the institution that steals from everybody, not just my brother, but uh, for no reason, the, uh, the good reason because I mean. They're all. Everybody's expecting things to fall down. They're going to need all that stuff. They trash. <laughs> and, you know, they pay a lot of money to get all kinds of stuff up here. And then, anyway, I, I, it's the, the the remedy is if the same people that have themselves st- set up to lie and cheat and steal from the people, if they become aware that that's what they're doing, and then stop instead of stealing. They can ask the people to contribute to the projects that they want to contribute to. What voluntary exchange? Yeah, that w- would be good because then, and then people who really, really want to get behind something, you know, maybe the flowers, you know, they'll pay for it themselves. Yeah, well, the, yeah, they'll and they'll get a group together and everybody will get their money together and. Now, hang on a second, uh, Cecily, because that's exactly, using the flowers as an example, that is exactly what used to happen. And about 15 years ago or so, the borough decided that they didn't want volunteers doing it anymore and went and bought all of the equipment and hired a bunch of people to do it. And even at the um, at the meetings, when the people came out and said, no, we don't want the borough to do this, we will do it ourselves, they over... Uh, ruled the will of the people and said we're going to do it and we're going to do it with our equipment and with our employees. And what was it allowed? They spent two hundred two hundred thousand dollars on on little teeny cabins way up in the in the who's is what there for the rich people to go play in. <laughs> I, 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 but I, why why is it there, Cecily? I, I tried to get you. You were almost there. This this uh, volunteerism that you're talking about will never happen until people fundamentally hate the state. Why is the state putting flowers out there now? I'm saying state, right, it's any the government. Well, I, I don't state. like anybody's authority over me. And the question for people to ask is, wh- what authority do they have? Ask, question your own authority, and then you will probably walk a little bit lighter and not abuse so many people. Huh? What do yeah, you no, that's just, I mean, it's all accepting responsibility and, uh, you know, and asserting that you are ruler over yourself. Yeah. yeah, and and people don't want to start there. That's I think probably that's what they're scared of. They're like, oh, but if there wasn't, you know, if you didn't have mittens or Obama, you know, who's going to tell me what to do? Who's well, going to tell me what shoes to buy and how to tie them? They were they were brought up in our schools, which train you to usurp your own responsibility, even your mm-hmm. own possession of yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's it's uh, when you don't belong to yourself, it's very difficult to to <laughs> come from. From a, a, you know, from a, a sovereign place, if you're taught your whole life that you you're you, you must obey, and then from the state, right? So, Cecily, do you hate the state? Come on. Yeah, <laughs> Thank along you. with my mother. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> Thanks for the call, Cecily. Four five eight dog is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hey guys, this is Abe. Abe, what's on your mind? Abe, do you hate the state? <laughs> Man, I was so glad that you're going to ask me that question first. The answer is yes. Right on. But the crazy thing is, is, uh, is I w- I'm, you know, been listening this morning uh, to you know everyone call in and talk about hating the state or not hating the state or uh, what was it two callers ago? You know, well, something about taxes. Well, we should let the governor some, yeah, <laughs> something along those lines. Anyway, um, it's 
I think I think for me, when I was a minarchist, when I thought I was, you know, this this rebel who was trying to minimize the government, um, the the biggest decoupling that I didn't understand yet was the fact that the state, even though we say we the people of the United States, and we think that we have this government, you know, that's created by the people, it's not at all, and it's so hard for you know minarchists, people who think that they're on the edge of minimizing the state. To believe that, oh no no, it's still a people. It's like no, it's not. It has nothing to do with you. It has very little to do with your own power. And as soon as you can cross over that threshold of saying, wait a minute, this entity has nothing to do with me anymore. I am an anarchist, and I do hate the state. And to hate the state doesn't mean that I hate America. That doesn't mean I hate the citizens of America. It doesn't mean that I even have to hate my history of America. But it does mean that I that I absolutely hate the governing body that is over me, that is stealing me and robbing me of the lifeblood that you know that I produce every day. Yeah, that's a really good distinction to make uh, between like hating the state or the the people or the area or something like that. It is it is different, and the the uh, leap you're talking about that's kind of just a realization. Um, you know, Cecily was talking about people owning themselves and not realizing it. Uh, I think that that leap from um, you know small government to uh, to you know no theft is wrong murder is wrong I think that's like the leap where you decide that you are gonna own yourself and be responsible for yourself. Oh yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah, until you take that step, it's like well I'm I'm responsible for myself up to this point, and then I'm gonna cede my responsibility to some sort of parental entity that's made up of people um, less ethical and less intelligent than I am. <laughs> So yeah. So that's the that's the big leap right there, and it is it is a leap. There's not it's not like a smooth transition from you know, um, well you know less government is okay. Okay now no no government you know I'm gonna own myself. I'm gonna be responsible for, my, for myself. It's actually a this giant chasm that you have to kind of cross over, and it's a it's a scary thing for a lot of people. Oh yeah, and 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 it's exactly like you said. It is a giant chasm. I mean, it's it's weird to think about how how much you actually have to accept yourself. To go from saying, well, you know, I think limited government is okay, to, to going to, wait a minute, no, the government is 100% a bad thing for me and for the people around me and the people that I love and my nation as a whole. It is it is the worst thing that could possibly happen. And, it, and, and that is a giant leap. And it's, I keep going back in my mind going, man, what, what, what did I have? What seed entered my mind that, that caused me to get there? And it's, it's like you just said, David, it's, it's that acceptance of that every single thing in your life is directly your responsibility. Everything bad that, that can possibly happen to you should be something um, that, you know, should be a result of your choice, and everything that happens that's good in your life should be directly because of your choices. And once you can accept that, yeah, I mean, the rest is easy. Then then it's it's, it's like a no-brainer that, oh, wait a minute, yeah, this, this big parenting entity that's trying to control my life is wrong, no matter how you put it. <laughs> Yeah. And just to clarify, saying when I ask the question, do you hate the state? I'm not asking you because I don't think it's right. Do you hate Lisa Murkowski as a person? No, right? absolutely not. She's she's exactly. she's a, she's, a, she's, a, she's a person just 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 like you and me trying to make the world a better place. Unfortunately, she doesn't understand that making the world a better place for her is not okay if it makes the world a worse place for me or right. or anybody else. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or anybody else. We're me, talking about a system. Else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, exactly. and, and you know what, Abe? It's interesting that you say that because right there, that philosophical leap, all of a sudden, it undermines absolutely everything that we as a nation has done, uh, have done, going back to uh, the Spanish American War. Yep. From the from the moment that we start projecting our power into other countries. And we yep. start trying to tell them the way that they should set up their government, that we ought to be the ones telling them how they should live their lives. All of a sudden, we are on very shaky moral ground, and it undermines everything that, that we've been taught as patriotic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and to be completely honest, I think that, that a lot of that comes from, you know, okay, I grew up as a Christian. I have, you know, I have faith in God, and I was taught that it's super important that, that I live my morals you know, and and my lifestyle, so that I am a an, um, in an emulation for the people to copy. Well, at the same time, it was also taught to me, you know, not not necessarily directly, but more indirectly, that you know, it's also my responsibility to proclaim my 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 beliefs and try to convert people. 
And if that means to go so far as to like, you know, blatantly say, look, you guys are sinners and, you know, start, start banging on people's heads and stuff like that. And, you know, pushing people, pushing people away. That almost was, was okay because at least I was doing the quote unquote right thing. And, and I think that, that, that whole sentiment and that whole idea is, is where, um, Americans specifically quote unquote conservatives get their, you know, their justification for saying, well, you know, we need to bring democracy to the sandbox and we need to do, you know, all these good things because these people are suffering under blah, blah, blah. It's like, you know, as individual human beings, we all have the choice to, you know, I mean, yes, unfortunately, some of these people live in the sandbox and might be oppressed, but they also have the right to rise up on their own. And if they, you know, if they ask for help and there are individuals specifically individuals in the United States who want to help, that's okay. But to say that, that our government can just walk over there and steal from us to, yeah, anyway. It's interesting how yeah. humility gets suspended in that yep. whole equation because it's part of that, part of the religion that, that you know, you believe and you're professing and you're trying to get uh, people to, to see in you and want to emulate. Humility is supposedly a really big part of that religion. Oh, no, hey, yeah. take, take it a step farther. Abe? In, yeah. in in your religious background, if once you have proclaimed what you perceive to be the truth to someone, if they have rejected it, does your religion give you the right to put them in a cage because <laughs> because they don't live the way you think you ought to, they ought to be living? Of course not, Steve. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean. And then then why do we as a why do we as a society put people in cages for drug use? Oh, exactly. Why do why do we make laws that says that you can't marry anybody of a particular case, whether it's a, a homosexual marriage or whether it's a black man can't marry a white woman? I mean, why do we make laws like this? Exactly. I'm, that, and that's a, it's actually really fun for me to argue with other Christians on on that basis because it's like you 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 guys realize that that by saying that you know morally we have to. Um, you know, we we have to punish gay gay people for trying to get gay marriage. But, you know, it's 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 just wrong, and our nation's going to fall apart if they ever get gay marriage. It's like, you guys, seriously, think about it. The only proclamation that Christianity has on us of what was something we're supposed to do to other people is to love them. That's it. Period. It doesn't say that I can judge them. It doesn't say that I can push them around. It doesn't say that I can lock them in prison because they smoke some pot. You know, all it says is I can love them. I mean it. It actually says I can't even judge them. I think specifically it says mm -hmm. you know something along the lines of if if you do judge, you're you're in big trouble with your own. <laughs> Lest you be judged. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Abe, I'm gonna I'm gonna love you by uh, by by letting you go off the phones right now. Hey, thanks guys. Thanks, thanks for the call. Four five eight talk is the number. All right, Aaron, you still there? Yeah. All right. I am. You want to say anything before we come up here on the uh, the top of the hour break? Yeah, I wanted to say that um, that's why governments love going outside of their country so much because they can wield whatever power they want and the people accept it because it's not us. I mean, you look at um, you look at England, the best empire ever. As far as landmass goes, only the Mongols competed with them for the most territory mm -hmm. taken. And they're the founders of common law. They Inside of England, they were the biggest respecters of rights, but outside of England, they were the biggest destroyers of life. And yep. we have that same syndrome today in America that everything that's good for us isn't good for anybody else. We don't respect, we don't care about human rights, even though we would pretend to. We don't care about liberty or freedom for anybody, only for ourselves. We have England syndrome, and we're becoming an empire just like they were. Yep. England syndrome, I like that. All right, Aaron, I'm going to have you call back on the other side of the break so we can try to get rid of that beeping noise there on the line. And uh, stay with us. We've got the Fox News right now. And the start of hour two of the program, I'm sorry, it started a completely separate program. Patriots Lament coming up right after the Fox News here on KFA. All right, 458 Talk is the number. You have found your way to the Patriots Lament program right here on KFAR. I am Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine. Joining me in the studio, we've got Dave Giesel, anarcho-capitalist extraordinaire. <laughs> and we've got uh, Josh Bennett from... The, one of the sponsors of the program, of course, Bighorn Enterprise. The other sponsor being Far North Tactical. And uh, Aaron Bennett was on the phone before, but he left us. And now we have Jeff Berwick from the Dollar Vigilante on the phone, calling us from our free neighbor to the south. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, guys. How you doing? Doing great. You're our uh, first guest um, at our one-year anniversary show here. So, All Yeah, right, welcome. Well, uh, congratulations. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an honor having you, uh, you on to kick off our second year of the show. 
Happy to be here. So uh, to start off, um, if you want to give a quick background of yourself and what you're doing in Mexico, just for our callers who aren't familiar with uh, with what you're doing, that'd be great. Certainly. Uh, as you know, David, I run uh, the Dollar Vigilante, which is a free market uh, newsletter, which uh, is all about uh, surviving the coming collapse of the U.S. dollar. And uh, I write about that. I also am a anarchist. I'm a free market person. I believe in only voluntary transactions. I, I believe in the non-aggression principle. And, uh, yeah, I live down here in Mexico. I'm originally from Canada, so I know what the cold weather's like up there in Alaska. And my parents are actually from uh, the Yukon originally, uh, so I know it very well. And I uh, decided that was enough cold weather for me, and now I live down in Mexico. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think I'm about to make that same decision. Went down and visited <laughs> Jeff for uh, a couple weeks with a buddy of mine, Josh, and uh, it was quite an experience, not just the weather and the fun, but the uh, the amount of personal freedom that people have down there. Um, we wanted to uh, start off by asking you about uh, kind of the door closing. We can kind of hear the hinges creaking as the the window for Americans to get their assets and another part of their body out of the country. <laughs> um, you you wrote a couple weeks ago or last week about the uh, the Facebook founder and the and the bill that was being passed uh, specifically in his honor. Um, can you talk to us about? Uh, that window closing and, and what you see that being like and what sort of options are available? Certainly, um, yeah. If for anyone who doesn't know, Edward Saverin, who was one of the co-founders of Facebook, uh, right before they went public, he announced or he actually gave up or renounced his uh, U.S. passport and became a, uh, a full, just a, only a Singapore citizen. He's actually originally from Brazil. And uh, that uh made it so he had pretty much avoided uh, uh, hundreds of millions in, in capital gains taxes and over the course of his lifetime probably billions of dollars in taxes and uh, so it's very good for Edward uh, but uh, the U.S. government didn't like that too much especially people like Charles Schumer uh, who uh, almost lost his mind at the thought that one of his uh, prized tax slave cows could actually escape and actually go somewhere else and not have to pay uh, into eternity, into all of their uh, criminal systems and, and their w- welfare and their warfare and everything else they do. And uh, so, yeah, he started up something called the Expatriate Act. And it's actually, uh, the actual name of the act is Expatriation Prevention, which should really <laughs> wake up some people who have been possibly thinking of leaving uh, the U.S. For, because of what's going on, what people like Barack Obama and all these people are doing it. A lot of people are obviously not very happy about it, and obviously not getting uh, or getting half your income taken away every year by a criminal mob called the government is it's not very good either. And, uh, and some people have been thinking about leaving. Well, this was the wake up call. That was the uh, as I put on on our blog. That was the hinges on the door creaking. You could hear the sound of the door closing. Uh, if you don't know now that uh, the U.S. government will make your life a living hell uh, trying to get out in the future. Uh, uh, then you're really just not paying attention. And we've been talking about this for years. So for us, it's, it's sort of been an uh, unhappy uh, thing to find out that we're right. We've been warning mm-hmm. people for a number of years that it's not going to be easy to get out uh, over the next few years. It's going to get harder and harder. And as the government uh, continues to collapse, which it is, the U.S. government is already well beyond bankrupt. Uh, and as the U.S. dollar continues to go towards zero, they'll get more and more desperate. And the only thing they can do now is just, uh, take away more and more assets of their own citizens to stay alive. And Jeff, I, I, I'm in, interested in your listening to you about this idea of a prize tax cow escaping and that now there's, you know, swinging the door start and calling it the Expatriation Prevention Act. Isn't that, I mean, just a, a more moderate way of what the East Germans did when they put up the Berlin Wall? Isn't that what they did, is that they they wanted to prevent their subjects from fleeing? I mean, the wall in, in Berlin wasn't put up to prevent West Germans from entering <laughs> East Germany, right? It, it, it was put up specifically to keep them from escaping. And, and that, yeah, that became the, this horrible image of, you know, the, the oppression of mankind. And I remember in 1989 when that wall came down on the celebrations around the world because of it, aren't we just now erecting our own wall? Absolutely. Uh, you, you know, the, I, when Edward Saverin left, I called it the defection. You know, that's what it is. And we used yeah. to hear that word defection a lot out of the communist uh, countries, Soviet Union, Cuba. You'd always hear, especially around Olympics time, uh, some athlete had defected. Well, that's what Americans are starting to do now, and it's starting to feel like that. And, uh, you know, the U.S. government is the most technologically advanced government of all time. They're building a billion-dollar data center in uh, 
uh, uh, Utah right now um, to track every single thing that all U.S. citizens do. Uh, and uh, there is a, a border that a lot of uh, U.S. citizens were clamoring for. Uh, there's a wall on the border of Mexico. Little did they know that's probably to keep them in What's- at some point. It's also uh, I, it's also funny because the uh, like the Republican establishment is whipping up conservatives to advocate building the wall. It's like they're building the wall that's trapping them in. Yeah, I yeah, think it, even Ron Paul said that's what it was. Yeah, for. I mean publicly he said. Yeah. That, was, that was great. Well, <laughs> when you look at it, it, the amount of uh, Mexicans leaving the U.S. now has now surpassed the amount of Mexicans going to the U.S. So there's actually a uh, the Mexicans are fleeing the U.S. right now too. So uh, that border wall definitely is starting to look like uh, the cameras are starting to turn inward now. Mm-hmm. Um, something that has been a topic on uh, on your blog recently on your Weekend Vigilante and then over on uh, Daily Anarchist based on the uh, the little Anarchists we did was paper liberties versus real liberties. And uh, specifically one of the topics that came up was gun rights. Um, can you uh, can you tell us what you think about that? Because in America we have, I mean, you had this picture up of the Constitution, right, with, with certain amendments stamped out by bills. And we still, you know, stand on our paper rights and we yell really loud about them. Uh, but we have almost no real rights in practice. And how does that uh, contrast to a place like Mexico? Yeah, it's a big contra- contrast, and um, that's why we received a number of letters, and after we did our talk, and we talked about how it's a lot freer uh, lifestyle in Mexico. I'm in Mexico right now. It's very free. Uh, you can do almost anything you really want, and we got a number of people right in, and, and you know, I, I'm kind of I'm not uh, going against what they're saying either. I do really like the fact that it's gun ownership is still legal in the U.S. That's one of only really two countries on Earth, uh, U.S. and Switzerland. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the case, and I definitely support that. And I think it's horrible that in Mexico that uh, you need a license to get a gun. But my point was that no one in Mexico really cares about the government or their laws. So there is this law. You're supposed to have a license to have a gun. But if you go on uh, Dia de la Revolution Day, uh, Re- Revolution Day, um, uh, you know the amount of people firing guns off that night. It's like it's raining bullets the whole night. Uh, you know, like everyone has a gun. Uh, they just don't really care about what the government says. Whereas in the U.S. Uh, people do have guns as well, and they're they're allowed to have guns. They're given permission to have guns by their government, uh, but they really uh, don't see the difference. They think that the U.S. is a lot better than a place like Mexico because uh, of that, but they don't really realize those are just paper uh, things printed on a piece of paper from hundreds of years ago that really have no uh, meaning anymore. The U.S. government certainly does not listen to anything in the Constitution or anything like that. Uh, so for people who believe in gun ownership, which I certainly do, I totally advocate uh, self-defense and being able to defend yourself. Uh, and uh, people like that to think that uh, the only place that's good is the U.S. because there you're given permission to own it by the government. You have to realize that in a lot of places, they just don't really care what the government say, and that's even freer. Well, isn't it because we have the guns and we think that we're free to, to own the guns that we're actually submitting to so much other slavery? It's like we're the best armed slaves in the history of the world. Yeah, the, I really wanted to say that to them. Uh, you know, like, uh, there's so many guns in the U.S., and you hear from so many gun buffs that, uh, you know, they, that uh, – they can, it's the best country on earth because they have the guns, but they submit to all kinds of slavery and they never do anything. Even when they see a cop beating a cop or even killing an innocent civilian, no one pulls out a gun and kills the cop. No one ever has done that as far as I know, because they know as soon as they do that, their life is over because the state is so powerful in the U.S. So they're just, uh, it's really bizarre. They're incredibly well-armed incredibly obedient slaves at this point. <laughs> um, on, th- on that note, we were talking about Hans Hoppe's essay on uh, the myth of limited government and the prospects for a second American revolution. Um, what do you see as far as that goes, given the way that people think in uh, North America, you know, Canada and the U.S.? Um, as, you know, as the screws get turned here and um, more, you know, these expatriation acts and things like this get passed, uh, what do you think are the prospects? How do you see that kind of shaking down? Yeah, it's really hard to gauge. I don't, you know, you can never predict the future. I do mm-hmm. know that one of my only hopes for uh, many people in the U.S. still today is is gun ownership. Uh, if if for some reason or some way those guns get taken away, the U.S. is so far beyond done that I would never, ever even consider going there again. It would just be, <laughs> you know, just a complete police state. But uh, that's the only hope left. And uh, But like I said, no one seems to really use it. We keep hearing from these guys. We keep hearing them saying they're angry. A lot of Tea Party type guys saying, hey, you push us too far, we'll fight back. 
Well, they haven't yet. They, you know, holding up a sign is not really fighting back, especially if you're doing it in an area that's a uh, government permitted uh, free speech <laughs> zone. Uh, you know, like it's, it's really, you know, I'm not, I'm not promoting that going out there and killing cops. What I'm saying is, though, that uh, there's a lot of talk that they're going to do, they're going to fight back against the government, but they never do. And uh, it will be interesting to see if they ever do that. Uh, I'm sure there will be definitely pockets or outbreaks of uh, really riots and, and uh, almost civil war type things as the U.S. government collapses, as the U.S. dollar collapses. Uh, it's going to be interesting for sure, and that's part of the reason why I don't really live around there too much anymore. Is I, I'd rather watch that on a widescreen TV than uh, see it outside of my front window. <laughs> yeah, HD is good enough for you. Um, <laughs> yeah. What was the... Uh, You've you've been in Mexico for a while now. Do you know what the peso collapse was like for people there? How did they uh, handle that? Yeah, I wasn't here, but of course I know a lot of Mexican people, and I asked them. Mm -hmm. And they and actually I was uh, in Thailand as well, uh, and uh, right after the uh, Thai currency collapsed, and I'd asked them both, and they both had the same answers. Uh, The answers that uh, it was it was definitely not a period of time that was enjoyable at all for anybody for Mm -hmm. a year or two. Uh, but they all learned to get by. And the thing that I learned, though, is that most Mexicans and Thai people, they're very still quite tied into their families, tied into the land. Uh, you know, they're not living in big skyscrapers in the city with their food being shipped in from thousands of miles away still. So uh, when their currencies collapsed, they, it wasn't too big of a deal for a lot of people because they're sort of living day to day. A lot of them are still living on farms or close to where the food is grown. Uh, and things like that, whereas Americans, especially, I think the, with, when the U.S. dollar collapses, it's going to just be such a shock to so many uh, U.S. citizens because, again, like the Mexicans and the, and the Thais, they never had hundreds of years of thinking we're the best country on earth, we're always the richest, we're always the best, and uh, so that's, well, that's what a lot of Americans still think today. And when their currency collapses, it's going to come as a big shock. And, uh, you know, all the other things, like, a lot, you know, there's, over 25% of women today in the U.S. are on antidepressants. Uh, most people are medicated in one form or another. Uh, and when the, they don't have money to buy those pills anymore and things like that, there's going to be all sorts of chaos. It's just become such a, a uh, completely terrible culture thanks to all the government intervention over the last 100 years with things like welfare, public education, dumbing down people. It's really turned it into a really... Uh, not a great culture there at all. It's becoming, uh, you know, very materialistic, and there's not much family culture anymore. There's not much uh, community, and people don't really get involved with their communities much anymore. That's all caused by government who have who have separated people. Uh, uh, things like uh, what Obama does to help out, uh, you know, young uh, uh, unmarried women that have children. You know, they actually promoting like the uh, destruction of the family in the U.S. So. All of those things mean to me that it's going to be hit way harder in the U.S. than anywhere else that it's ever happened before. Yeah, and, you know, interesting to your point about the destruction of community, of course, all the answers that have been presented in recent years since uh, Obama got elected, anyway, to these problems is uh, we need to participate more heavily in the political system. And so the energies that have been focused on changing things have been focused entirely on a system of violence and expropriation instead of on peaceful uh, community means of actually uh, meeting each other's needs, which was in stark contrast to Mexico, where there's you know a strong sense of community and there's no government social nets that were apparent to me. Um, no. But people were, you know, they'd take care of each other or they'd find a way. You know, they'd go out, instead of waiting for their check at home, they'd go out and run a little business on the street. So That's right. And, uh, and what people don't realize, too, is like, there's so many homeless people in the U.S. People come to Mexico, and a lot of people think it's poor in Mexico, which is, you know, there is some poor people here just like anywhere, but it's, there's a huge middle class here, and really there's no homeless people at all in Mexico. I've never even heard of a homeless person. And again, that's all caused by government intervention. In the U.S., you can't build a house unless it's up to code. It's got to pay its property taxes, all that thing, all those sort of things. And like you said, uh, if you need to make some money, you can't just go out onto the street and start up a lemonade stand, as many young kids in the U.S. have found out lately. Uh, you need uh, many permits, thousands of dollars, uh, all sorts of things, whereas down here, there isn't any of that sort of thing. So they can recover so much quicker you know, Jeff, uh, because, uh, because of that. It, it, one, something, this is Steve again, something that happened here in Fairbanks, uh, it was a year or two years ago, there was actually a kid who went out on the street with a little mobile lemonade stand, and there are a lot of us that were like, yay, that's very nice, yay for an uh, entrepreneurial spirit. And it was not the government that went to shut him down, it was the local businesses 
who went yeah. and 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 ratted him out and basically insisted that the city move in against this kid with the lemonade stand because he was cutting in on their perceived profits. And it's very much yep. like one of the things we've talked about, about the sheep on the inside of the pen looking at some sheep on the outside and crying out to the farmer, hey, lose sheep, go get him. And do you, yep. Does that happen in Mexico? I mean, are there people who rat out their neighbors for doing something that the government tells them they're not supposed to do? Uh, there is at the highest level people like Carlos Slim, who's a billionaire. He uses the government to uh, enforce his monopolies on Telmex and things like that. Uh, but once you get down to the lower levels, no, they don't have anything like that. And well, what you're talking about is fascism. That's when the uh, businesses work with the government to uh, control uh, their competition and to uh, have monopolies over areas. And without government, businesses couldn't do this. Uh, like you couldn't imagine uh, uh, regular business going up to a kid, uh, like a guy who runs the McDonald's, he owns the McDonald's, going down to the kid with a, a lemonade stand with a gun and telling him to go away. He wouldn't do that. It wouldn't be very good. But uh, thanks to the magic of government, he can make a phone call. The government shows up, shuts it down, and that's how fascism works. And that's that's more prevalent in the U.S. than anything. It's, yeah. it's incredibly fascist in the U.S. today. Uh, uh, I call it uh, fascist communist because it's got the mix of both of them. But uh, <laughs> that's that's what it is. That's fascism. Um, uh, can you stay on for the uh, second half hour and take some calls on expatriation? Would that be possible? Sure, I'd be happy to. Okay, so do you want to throw out the number, Steve? All right, it's 458-TALK. We've already actually got all four lines okay, on cool. the Okay, um, cool. I got, I got one more question for this half hour. Um, something we've been talking about on this show is uh, I've recently come to the conclusion that the people who argue for less taxes, like a 15% flat tax, are standing on the same philosophical basis as the people who argue for a 90% soak-the-rich tax because fundamentally they don't believe that stealing is wrong. Um, in Mexico... Uh, we encountered a whole bunch of people, uh, business people, just the average guy in the street, who, when you ask them, you know, about cash transactions and taxes, they're like, I'm not paying taxes. They didn't view it as, they didn't say, I wish I paid less, or somebody's got to do it. They said, it's my money, and uh, nobody has a right to it except me. Um, how do you think that, you know, that mentality is, is, like, different on a social level, not just on a political level? Um, how do you think that plays into uh, the kind of the cultural difference? Well, it plays into a big time. Uh, really, the way I see it is uh, a place like the U.S. has really uh, perfected this horrible fascist government system to the point where uh, it, the government's involved in every facet of life in the U.S. But when you look at countries like Mexico or well, many other countries, uh, so many of them, you know, here in Mexico, most of people, uh, you know, they don't, uh, they spend a lot of time just at the beach or dancing or having fun. Uh, they're not that worried about uh, going out and making a ton of money, and that's because their life's so great. And, you, you know, you can kind of understand that, but it's when the government gets involved uh, that things get really bad, and, and they just haven't reached that level yet. They're, they're really at the point here where they're just learning about democracy, which is horrible. I see all these signs <laughs> for uh, political signs everywhere now, and you see young kids out promoting their favorite candidate. Uh, so they're getting there. Probably in, you know, 20 or 50 years, it'll be... Uh, something as bad as the U.S. here, uh, where they'll they'll go down this road of democracy and socialism and, and statism. Uh, but it's still not even at that point yet. It's sort of at the point probably where the U.S. is at, maybe like late 1800s. Uh, it really, there's not much involvement, or maybe early 1900s, because they have a central bank here, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, causes a lot of problems. But, uh, yeah, it, it, they just don't have that massive amount of uh, government involvement because they haven't reached that level of evolution yet. But they're definitely headed towards it. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, getting there. But uh, at this moment in time, it's so much better to be here than in a place like the U.S. where they've just perfected uh, statism. Mm, yeah, good good point. Hopefully they learn their lesson while the U.S. is collapsing and don't follow the same road. Not likely. Hopefully. All right. Uh, do you want to try to take a couple phone calls here before the break at the bottom of the hour? 458-TALK is the number. Let's see if anybody's still on hold. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hi, this is Randy. I hailed over from the last hour, last show, so my comment may not fit in with your guest. It's a different, different show. All right, we're going to let you go. Sorry, Randy. I'm not the one that makes the call. Good morning, caller. This is Patriots Lament, and we have now cleared the lines, nope. gentlemen. Oops. <laughs> well, yeah, there we go. That's fine. Um, 
Well, they're full anyway, so. Well, yeah, no, the lines are clear. Uh, call in. Four five eight talk is if the number. Now, now Randy can call in. Sure. Because now it's now it's a different show and it's no holdovers from the last hour. We want to stay on the topic though. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me let me ask a question here of Jeff here. This is Steve again on on this issue of freedom and of government control and of an intervention in people's lives. At at what point can you not avoid it? I mean, at some point, is there just like no place left to run, and you just have to have to submit to some level of government or another? I mean, that's that's kind of the the fatalistic approach that I keep hearing from all of these people who talk about how we need to compromise our values and participate in the the political system and elect somebody who will compromise as well, so that we can all get along. Is there in, in your mind, Jeff? Is there ever a place where you just give up and submit to a government? In my mind, no, never. <laughs> I will never do that. But, uh, you know, when I hear the people, uh, especially Americans, they'll say things like, well, we know it's really bad here, but it's just as bad everywhere else. Well, if you ask them, they usually don't even own a passport. Uh, you know, if you get out and see the world a bit, uh, very few countries are this developed in statism and oppression as the U.S. right now. It's, it's one of the most oppressive places on Earth. The only places that even compete at this point are North Korea, Cuba, uh, maybe a few others I can't think about the top of my head. Uh, really, like the amount of government involvement in your life is just uh, unbelievable. And of course, uh, UK and Europe are very similar as well. Um, but uh, to, to say that to, to just give up uh, one way or another, either uh, you know, I, I don't. I think we're going to win this fight. Actually, I think you know all these governments are collapsing right now. All the Western governments are in a state of collapse. And thanks to the internet, we can spread the word about liberty and about. Uh, self-dependence and about how you can actually live without the government, which a lot of people have forgotten about, uh, and how good it can be and how it can actually make the world such a better and more peaceful and more prosperous place. Uh, you know, we have a lot of chances here, and there is a lot of countries that still haven't gotten anywhere near close to the U.S., so uh, they're, they're going to be okay as long as uh, they can keep their eyes open and we can keep the Internet open in their countries. Uh, and, uh, yeah, no, so I don't have a fatalistic approach at all. I think we're definitely going to win. It's just going to be interesting to see how we get through the collapse. You know, these, these nation states have only been around for a few hundred years. It's not like they're a, a permanent fixture. They're just a blight on the uh, evolution of humanity at this point. Yeah, they're actually um, a more temporary form of government at this point than existed before. You know, you had the empires and the kings, and those lasted, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. This whole nation state concept really didn't kick off until... Uh, Wilsonian democracy started being spread at the point of many guns and bayonets. That was just about 100 years ago, and that's yep. it. All right, uh, we are now at the halfway point, and those of you on hold, we will come back and hit the phones right after the Fox News. 458-TALK is the number. Jeff Berwick calling in from uh, points south from the uh, Dollar Vigilante. You can check them out online, dollarvigilante.com. And also, of course, you can check us out online at patriotslament.blogspot.com. Be right back. All right, welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. It's brought to you by Far North Tactical over there at 8th and Lacey. It'll help you get prepared for the coming zombie apocalypse. Also brought to you by Big Horn Enterprises when performance matters. And uh, joining us in the studio from Big Horn, we've got Josh Bennett and uh, one of our favorite local... Anarcho capitalist is in the studio. That's Dave Yeasel. And then joining us on the phone is another anarcho capitalist, is uh, Jeff Berwick from the Dollar Vigilante. Would you describe yourself as an anarcho capitalist or something else? Yeah, that's a perfect word. Uh, I like just anarchist because that actually means uh, the same as anarcho capitalist, really, in my opinion. But, uh, uh, you know, we have to use these different words because uh, the governments have uh, taken over the control of these words and made them sound all scary now. But uh, uh, anarchist just means that you believe in uh, peaceful uh, transactions, voluntary transactions. Jeff, I wanted to, this is Josh. I wanted to ask you something real quick that we, we've asked every caller in the last hour, and it's just a simple Yes or no question. It's, uh, do you hate the state? Oh, yeah, I hate it so much. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we figured. Um, I had someone call me on the, the break there, and thought we, they asked me to ask you if you could explain a little bit more of the Schumer bill, the Expatriation Act, what it really means and how it will affect us. They weren't sure. They said we kind of glazed over it, but they weren't quite sure what that actually was. Yeah, well, it hasn't passed yet, but it... You know, I, it might pass. I'm, I'm not sure if it will pass, but they're trying to pass. Basically, the bill uh, tries to make it so anyone uh, who wants to expatriate or, or leave the country, renounce their citizenship, uh, they're going to 
I do a number of things, and probably the most craziest thing that, I, that, that is a part of this bill is if you do not decide to renounce your U.S. citizenship, and under this act, you will never be allowed to return to the U.S. again. <laughs> and uh, that's just simply unbelievable that they would do that. And I wrote a blog about it, and I said, uh, you know, we're getting to the point where no one's going to want to go there much more anyway. Uh, but, uh, but that is something that was just crazy in this bill. Another one is they're going to uh, still tax you, get this. So you're not even a citizen of the U.S. anymore. Let's say you're a citizen of Singapore or wherever you go. Uh, they will tax you for life on any capital gains you make in the U.S. Uh, so you're still going to get uh, capital gains tax for the rest of your life if you do that, uh, and a number of other things like that. So they're just basically trying to make it uh, less and less so people want to uh, uh, expatriate, uh, because obviously those, especially the people who really want to expatriate, usually have a fair amount of assets, and the, uh, it only takes a few of those, a few hundred or a few thousand uh, Edward Saverans of Facebook, and that really can uh, change the uh, tax structure of the U.S. and then accelerate the bankruptcy of the U.S. government. Perhaps shows how uh, scared of their tenuous, losing their tenuous power the uh, the people in charge are. You know, Peter Schiff talks about capital going where it's well appreciated. And, uh, you know, like you said, if, if they really want to close the door and lock people out, people won't want back in. So... All right, yeah, we got yeah, well, they, the one percent, the top one percent of uh, wealthy people in the U.S. pay something like forty or sixty percent of the taxes. So uh, if those one percent leave, it, it's sort of like Atlas Shrugged. Uh, <laughs> if those one uh, percent leave, it, just, uh, that's the end of the country. So uh, that, that's why they're taking these uh, radical actions right now. All of our lines are on hold. Shall we go to the phones? Let's do it. Four five eight talk is a number. Good morning, caller. This is Patriots Lament. Who's this? Are you there? Red. Red, go ahead. You know, one of your uh, guests that got there said that he didn't see no homeless. As they're coming over the border into the United States, or they're laying in the desert with their head and their hands chopped off. Um, are you talking about the, the drug, uh, the, these uh, highly publicized drug killings on the border? Jeff, do yeah. you see a lot of beheadings down there? I have yet to see my first beheading, though. No. All right. So. Uh, these, uh, these, uh, you know, this does happen. It's all caused by the U.S. government. The U.S. government's uh, war on drugs is causing all of these things, and they're also the Obama administration is on record running uh, high-powered uh, machine guns into Mexico and giving it to the uh, narco gangs. Uh, so they're trying to destabilize Mexico, and then on top of that, they use their media try to scare people in the U.S., and uh, so it just takes one headless body uh, to make a lot of Americans decide we're not going to go there. Uh, but uh, if you actually look at it, the amount of um, uh, the actual murder rate for Americans in, in the U.S. is about seven per 100,000. Uh, the amount of uh, murder rate for Americans in Mexico, like when they visit Mexico, is two in 100,000. So you're actually three times safer as an American going to Mexico than staying in the U.S. So this is mostly sensationalist propaganda to try to uh, keep the U.S. US citizens again in their own country, uh, because uh, otherwise they'd all be wanting to leave at this point. Thanks for the call. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning. This is Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hey, this is Roger. Roger, what's on your mind? Well, um, I was just thinking about how, how when I call this show, I feel like I feel like I have someone on my side, kind of, you know, like I've, I've gone, you know, I entered politics, I entered, you know, this world that I had no clue about three years ago, and since then I've gone through the Republican Party, the Tea Party, the, you know, all these parties searching for someone who, who believes the same thing that I believe, and, and I've ended up here, but every... Outside of the show, I don't know a single person who really believes the same thing that I believe. You know, Aaron and Josh and Dave. Uh, that's <laughs> They're um, the only people, and everyone works to make me sound crazy out here. <laughs> and I feel like I feel like I'm in a cage. <laughs> you know, is, yeah. that, is that how any of you feel? Please tell uh, me you feel the same. You know. <laughs> well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go after that, and I'm gonna let uh, Jeff have it. I was hanging out with some of my friends last night. I have three really good friends who are. Uh, they're they're way up there. They're probably you know the most important people I know. And we were hanging out last night, and they're all ANCAP, and we were in the midst of statism all around us. It was just invading our world, and we were all kind of lamenting that you know the world we really want doesn't exist. But it did exist. It existed between the four of us uh, when we were talking that night right there in that room. 
And um, I know uh, with Josh, who went with me to Mexico, we felt very much the same way hanging out with uh, Jeff down there. And he's putting together a you know a community down there of like-minded people. And there's one in uh, New Hampshire with the Free Staters. And so, you know, in every community, there's there's people who think like that. And if you can find them and spend time with them, you can discover that, that free world, you know, even if it's a fleeting uh, thing that only exists when you're uh, meeting with those people. Yeah, it's funny. That's why I came to Alaska. And and it's really it's not any different here. I mean, there's, there's so few people that and they, they, they succeed at making me feel crazy sometimes, all these people. <laughs> Roger, Roger, you're not crazy, Roger. You're you're the only sane one, in, and you're it's like waking up in an insane asylum. Okay, you've been you have been kidnapped. You you went to bed one night, drugged, kidnapped in your sleep, and you woke up in an insane asylum. Mm-hmm. Try to convince everybody around you that you're sane. <laughs> not gonna happen, brother. It, it, yeah. It, but but like David said, it, you you are you do have people here in this town, mm-hmm. individuals here and there like Josh, like Dave, like myself, that really do believe these things, try to find them. Get together. Go to the, where you have a meetup over at Denny's normally, don't you, Dave? No, it's at, uh, where are we having it? It's, it's on the, the meetup site. If you've We've got, had it at a few different places. So if you've got access yeah. to the Internet, Roger, go online to the... Yeah, go to go to uh, meetup or just Google um, uh, campaign for Liberty Fairbanks and you'll find our meetup. And you know, there's there's like-minded people, and that's one of the most important things because otherwise you do feel like you're going insane. And you know, with the internet, you have things like this too. You have sites like LouRockwell.com and and the Dollar Vigilante, Dollar Vigilante and Daily Anarchist. Daily Anarchist, and you ha- you have these places where there's there's actually people who don't want to kill you. They they actually want to interact with you voluntarily. They don't want to steal from you and kill you all the time. They don't want to lock you in a cage for having a difference of opinion. And uh, of course, you know it's not as satisfying just to find that on the internet. But that's it's certainly nice to know it's out there and to hear from other voices in other parts of the world who are echoing the same thing. And then when you find people like that in your community, it's just it's a super valuable thing. And there are other places in the world too where you can find that in uh, greater concentration. So. Yeah, they are. Just in the last two years is here since I've lived in Alaska, it's only been the last two years where I realized it wasn't just uh, a few of my family members that believed like I did. There's other people out there. And, and look at it historically, too. I mean, when Rome fell, it didn't fall in a day. Okay? But as it was falling, it was little pockets, little communities here and there that preserved certain truths that that grabbed certain yeah, books with, with and Drew, the, and withdrew consent yeah you know well it, and even jeff Ber- berwick here um you obviously get i would hope tons of people that are like-minded that are asking you these same things right i want to get out get away so we're not alone in this there's people out there that are awake i would think yeah you know I, it's sometimes still on? I, I feel bad even yeah i just had a kid oh. i had another kid or I have another kid on the way, and, uh, you know, I feel bad just going down and getting their social security number. You know, it seems like I was born into a contract that was made between between people who don't have anything to do with me, and and they've, they've sold me into slavery before I was ever born, and I'm really not doing all I can do to, to prevent that from happening to my son. <laughs> well, how, how does a, how does a slave yeah. fight fight slavery? Well, there, you know, I feel like, what can you really do? Well, you, no. you know, you can withdraw consent, and uh, you know, being I, I've gone through that. I call it the libertarian depression. You go through like a phase where you're you're conservative or you're liberal or whatever, and and then you realize that that's totally incongruent and full of contradictions. And you throw that out, and then you get into libertarianism. And it's like, yeah, we're gonna elect, you know, Ron, Ron Paul. Paul yeah. And then it's like, well, no, that's that's not gonna work either. And then you're just you just you feel gutted, right? It's like, what are we gonna do? There's no political way of doing this. Um, and that's that's really rough. But on the other side of that, there's a really empowering part where you realize, you know, I own myself. I'm in control of my life. You know, no matter how much the state says, I can do this, I can't do that, I can do whatever I want. I'm an adult, and I can accept the responsibility for that. And, and the there's, state is going to collapse. Right, and there's and there's other actions you can do. You know, there's this, this window of things that we think we can do. It's like, well, I can vote for this guy or I can vote for this guy. But there's all sorts of other things you can do. You can, uh, you can move money overseas, you can travel, you can expatriate, you can uh, work in, the, you know, you can have a little underground business. There's, there's all sorts of other options out there. You can go see Jeff. 
you can go visit Jeff. Yeah, Jeff, uh, you've had a bunch of movers down there recently. Um, tell us about the, the community that's kind of coalescing down there. Yeah, it's really been great because uh, we're getting almost every week a couple guys just coming down, hanging out. Uh, we, we end up hiring most of them for stuff we're doing. That's how fast our business is going because we also help people get uh, foreign passports, get uh, offshore bank accounts, uh, and our newsletter itself talks about all these topics. So we have a growing in, uh, media enterprise going on here, and uh, we end up hiring a lot of these young guys to come down. They're not all young guys. There's older guys as well. Uh, and uh, But, yeah, they're, they're really attracted to these sort of uh, things, uh, uh, being around like-minded people, and obviously you came down daily with Josh, and I know you guys had a great time, and uh, yeah, it's really great. And the one thing I would say to your caller is, um, you know, the re- the thing that really uh, opened my eyes was traveling. Uh, if you stay in the place where you're from, uh, you know, especially the U.S., where the, the media is so controlled, I wouldn't even call it media anymore. It's just basically they're reading straight off the uh, teleprompter that Barack Obama's reading off of. And, uh, uh, you know, of course, the public schools, that's just indoctrination. They teach you just completely uh, memorized uh, status socialist uh, stuff. Uh, and so once you can get outside of that, there's so many countries that haven't gotten that far down this road yet, and some of them are not even far at all, uh, that you can, and you can see how people react and how they act and when they're free people. And it's totally different than how Americans act. Americans, uh, the more I go back lately, they seem more and more uptight. They seem more tense. I think they sense something's wrong. Uh, and I think they're, they're getting more pressure. Their standard of living is constantly going down thanks to their government and thanks to the Federal Reserve constantly inflating the dollar. And uh, it just seems so stressful. And uh, people are just stressed out there. Whereas when you come to a place like, for example, Mexico, uh, most people are just incredibly relaxed. And you can kind of talk to them. And you, you just talk to them. And they'll... They don't know what Republican is. They don't know what the Democrat is, and, and that's good, right? And and uh, you just talk to them, and they, they understand what you're talking about when you talk about freedom, because that's how they live. Uh, they don't. They haven't bought into this whole status thing yet. So by getting outside of the country, you really uh, helps open your eyes to the potential out there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe that's what I need to do. Thank you, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks, don't Roger. forget that there's people out here who are who are counting on you guys to keep going and keep keep inspiring us. No, you guys off, really appreciate it. You guys are the, are the reason we do this show. Yeah. And, it's and, really and, great to hear uh, that. Uh, hey, here's, here's my little capitalist plug, too, is that one of the, one of the things that makes this show possible is sponsors. <laughs> one of the things that makes possible is the people who are listening go out and actually go to the sponsors and, and reward them for sponsoring the program by buying things. <laughs> Just to want to remind you that we do not take any government funds Big, here. Bighorn <laughs> Enterprises and Far North Tactical. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, thanks right. for the call. Really appreciate Four, that. 458-TALK yeah. is the number. Good morning. I mean, we uh, have lost that last call. We've got about 10 minutes left or so in the program. Uh, it, and I, I'm, I'm looking at the way things are going right now. With uh, I mean, I've had Drudge Report up this morning. We've got more and more bailouts coming for Europe. We've got uh, all of these currencies, all of these currencies around the world that are teetering on the edge of collapse. And the only solution that's being touted is we need more government bailouts. I, I saw uh, one of the headlines is that uh, you know people need to stop complaining and just pay their taxes. <laughs> what do you do yep. with that? Well, that's you can uh, you can continue to fight it or you can walk away. I say, you know what, Here, here's one of my personal solutions in all of this is, look, right now I, I don't feel the freedom to take my family down to Mexico. I, it's not that I particularly dislike Mexico. However, I did grow up in Arizona, Jeff, and i got to tell you, it's too dang hot down there. I like the cold. <laughs> I, I like it up here. Uh, however, for me, uh, one of the things I can do is I can fight from you know the government uh, taking my money by trying to take as much back as I can by claiming every possible exemption that I can, you know whether it's property tax exemptions or whether it is uh, income tax, everything I can possibly qualify for I take. There's uh yeah there's there's different approaches that was of course what uh, Ragnar in Atlas Shrugged did, right? He would take his pirate ship out and steal the gold bars from the from the U.S. government ships. I haven't taken it, it that far yet, but I'm thinking about it. And give it back to the, uh, to the industrialists. <laughs> I think you're, you're still uh, trying to steal back paper. Right. Well, but, uh, <laughs> that's true. Privateers. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, withdrawing consent, I think, you know, silence is one of the loudest things you can do sometimes. And, um, you know, clearly with uh, this the Schumer bill and everything, they're telling you what the strongest action you can take. Right? A guy says... I'm leaving and I'm cashing out. You know, I'm taking my money with me, right? I'm taking what's mine. And they go, no, you're not. And they're far more concerned about withdrawing consent than than 
um, participating more in the system. Nobody, there's no bills being passed to keep you from voting for Ron Paul, okay? But there are bills being passed to keep you from leaving. Uh, the door is closing, and the, if you're still on the farm, if you you know Mullen, Stefan Molyneux who talks about this, he's like, you got a cattle that has you know a big tattoo on his side that's like the farmer sucks. Well, the farmer doesn't care about that if the cow is still in the middle of the pasture, not walking towards the giant <laughs> hole in the fence. He's like, yeah, I do suck. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I it's just my opinion, but I think withdrawing consent is uh, one of the most powerful things you can do. Yeah, Gandhi said that uh, one of the best ways to end a, a system like this is to uh, stop paying into it. And uh, Gandhi affected a lot of change. He wasn't an anarchist per se, but a lot of his thoughts were quite uh, anarcho-like, uh, quite uh, peace- peaceful. And uh, he, he affected a lot of change by withdrawing uh, uh, support for the system. And, uh, you know, I think that's the way. Like, I talked to a lot of Americans, they think the way forward is a, a, a revolution. You know, with these drones and the American military, and you know, I don't think they're going to win uh, that kind of a war. The only way you're going to win this is through peace and just withdrawing consent. And if we get enough people doing it, this could uh, really affect change. And I don't know if we're quite there yet, but over the next few years, uh, perhaps Ron Paul can continue to spread the message of freedom uh, that we could get to that point. But again, so many people in the U.S. are so dependent on the government now that it's it's uh, it's just a big mess at this point. 458 Talk is a number. Good morning, call. You're on Patriots Lament. Who's this? This is John Galt. John Galt. Good to hear oh, from you. Who is John Galt? <laughs> That's the big question. You know, after shrugging, I've had a difficult time, but it's been, uh, you know, by my own uh, seat of the pants, uh, my own labor, that I've I've able to survive. Uh Jeff, you talk about Mexico being uh, nirvana. Uh, I find that hard to believe. Uh, why would uh, the, the Mexican folks uh, uh, come over here to our country and attempt to earn a wage? Uh, apparently the, the wage uh, south of the border has got to be quite a bit less, you know, and and I'd like to also point out uh, that you already have, I guess, but uh, it all boils down to money. And what served as money is 5,000 years is, is uh, basically uh, the precious metals. And, uh, well, um, yeah, go for it, Jeff. Yeah, to answer your question, uh, I don't think Mexico is Nirvana. Um, I, I believe that as a non-Mexican, it's a great place to live uh, because you can live quite free here. I've never even really spoken to a cop, I don't think. I've even paid attention to them. They don't really seem to even care about me because they realize that a lot of their money comes from tourism. Uh, so you can live quite free here as a tourist. You're not one now, of their cows. Tourist, yeah, that's right. That, they actually, well, actually, that's the way you want to live. That's called a free flag theory. Uh, it's called it being a permanent traveler or a permanent tourist or a uh, prior taxpayer, basically. And then you want to live, uh, you want to have a passport from one country, have your businesses in another country, and you actually want to live in another country as a tourist because that's when the government always treats you quite well. They always treat the tourists very well. And, uh, and so that's how I live here. Now, of course, uh, there is, uh, you know, a lot of uh, Mexicans have gone up to the U.S., especially over the last few decades, because uh, the economy up in the U.S. was so much better, mostly on funny money, but uh, it, no one seemed to realize it until lately. Uh, and uh, But now, actually, the stats are that more Mexicans are leaving the U.S. than going there now, and I've talked to so many Mexicans, and, and there's two reasons they don't go. There's not the uh, economic opportunities there used to be, and second one, the big one, is there's, there's hardly any freedom there, and they don't want to live like that. And, uh, and uh, so... That's basically my answer is like that Mexico is not perfect. And I, I know that people think I talk a lot about Mexico a lot, but that's just because I'm here. Uh, there's a lot of great countries as well uh, that you can also live quite free. Uh, there's a lot of great things about the U.S. for living there if, if you like, but uh, I just can't handle the uh, government oppression and the uh, constant uh, monitoring and, and uh, all that sort of a thing. But, uh, yeah, Mexico is not perfect at all. Everyone's got their own place, uh, but really you have to come down to see it to uh, – to get an understanding, because you're not going to get a proper understanding of it from your media or from the government. Can you uh, also talk about gold and silver as money and some of the stuff that's going on in Mexico relating to that? Sure. Uh, the, uh, the A good friend of mine, Hugo Salinas Price, he's actually, I think, the 14th richest man on earth. He lives uh, in Acapulco near where I live, and uh, we talk all the time. And he's been trying to reinstitute silver to be accepted as money in the system. Uh, he's, he hasn't gotten very far, though, yet. 
Uh, but he's been really trying to do that. Uh, of course, I believe that gold and silver are an excellent money. I believe the money should be left up to the marketplace to be decided what is money, and we shouldn't be forced uh, to uh, accept the piece of paper with dead uh, pictures of criminals printed on it and, uh, and that sort of a thing. I believe in voluntary transaction and peace. And uh, the, the, uh, for the last 5,000 years, as you said, gold and silver have been what has been selected by the free market as money, and I believe it still would be at least one of them today, including things like Bitcoin as well. Uh, but, uh, yeah, until the, uh, what, we're, what we're witnessing right now is the collapse of the fiat currency system. It could never really last. It's only lasted since 1971 uh, when they took the gold backing away from the dollar, and uh, you have witnessed what happened after that. It's just been downhill from there. One of the interesting things when people talk about the collapse of the dollar, the impending collapse of the dollar, uh, there was an article on Daily Anarchist about a month ago, and the columnist noted that the dollar has already collapsed. It's already lost 98% of its value since 1913. And so uh, it only has two more percent to go if you go from that metric. And that was, a, I thought, an interesting perspective because we always have these small slices in time that we look at. Well, yeah, people ask me a lot when it's all going to collapse, and I say it's already collapsing. It's been collapsing since 1913, and it's definitely gone extra downhill since 1971. Mm-hmm. And we're about to enter the uh, hyper phase in the next few years. Yeah, I have a... Uh a little plaque at home, and it has a, a $100 trillion bill from Zimbabwe. And in that plaque right below it is uh, one silver ounce. And in the, in the plaque it asks, which has value? <laughs> well, obviously not the $100 trillion. <laughs> how, how long is it going to be before you're ripping that plaque right? open to get to that silver? That's what I want to know. <laughs> well, I know I'll never be ripping the plaque open to get the piece of paper out. Yeah, no doubt. All right, four five eight dog is the number. Good morning, caller. All right, we've uh, cleared the lines again. Um, I got a I Go got ahead. a call uh, or I had a text from somebody who is uh, apparently a little bit afraid to call in. They were asking. They said, "Ask Jeff if he offers bulk discounts for people moving down there. If somebody wants to buy like ten condos at once." <laughs> of course, just give me a call. I don't know why you'd be scared to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> All prices are negotiable. That's the Mexican way. That's the free market way. Yeah. Now, what if? All right, I've got another question here for you, Jeff. What if you don't have a whole lot of assets to move in the first place? Uh, I mean, if, if, yep. if I mean, obviously, somebody who has already amassed uh, wealth over a period of time is in danger of losing them. If you don't have a lot of wealth in the first place, and you're just a kind of a hand-to-mouth kind of an, a survivor to begin with, what motivation would you have uh, to, of, of leaving and going down to Mexico? You know, every person is different, so there's no way I can give individual advice. You know, everyone's got all the kinds of things that they like and they don't like. But the thing I try to tell to a lot of uh, U.S. citizens is that uh, don't limit yourself just to the U.S. Um, You know, the U.S. economy is going downhill. It's not going to go up anytime soon, uh, and it's just going to get worse and worse. So look at uh, other opportunities. Look to make money over the Internet. Uh, Look to... uh, get into other countries. There's so many opportunities. The opportunities I see as an entrepreneur when I travel, it's just it's staggering. It's just there's nothing but opportunity out there. And then when I go to the U.S., I see nothing but none, no opportunity because of the fascist system, all the rules and regulations. Uh, it makes it pretty much impossible for a younger person to start up a business there now. Uh, so, so don't limit yourself to the U.S. and look at other options. And then also use the Internet. The Internet's a huge uh, advantage that we still have today. Yeah, something um, that I commented on one of your posts was can't afford to leave um, is changing into can't afford to stay. And one of the things that Josh and I certainly noticed in Mexico is if, if you got a couple hundred bucks once you're down there, there's business opportunities everywhere. I mean, you could start anything from from you know a hundred dollar business out of pocket to if you have you know ten grand or you know a little bit more, you could buy an old an unfinished dilapidated building and finish it out. I mean, something, there's yeah. there's stuff everywhere there, and you can you can start it with you know, essentially no capital at all. Um, obviously, having capital makes it easier, but because there are opportunities, you're, you're moving to the opportunity. You know, you can stay somewhere where everything's drying up, but then you're going to be caught where, where it's, you know, everything's dead and it's all gone. Or you can, um, you know, you can get ahead of the curve and move someplace where there's still opportunity and, and take advantage of that. Yeah, just really briefly, I know we're running out of time, but I started my condo business and which turned into a hotel business with zero money down. I, I used other people's money like from sales to uh, to uh, do it. And I couldn't have done that in the U.S. You can't start. I couldn't have sold real estate without a real estate license, right? And you need all sorts of expenses to get started. And the same with a hotel. Here, I just did it all basically in the black market. Mm-hmm. The free market. Free market. That's what the black market is, yeah. 
Yeah, well, something um, I want to talk to him about. You're coming to the end. Do you want to give us a rundown of your uh, your websites and and what you offer? Sure, it's just the Dollar Vigilante, dollarvigilante.com. Uh, if you're into the anarchist stuff, we do a podcast called Anarchast. That's a n a r c h a s p dot com. And uh, yeah, we offer all sorts of information. All the stuff we've been talking about in this show is what we write in our newsletter. Uh, ways for people to get out from uh, the oppression of the U.S. government. Yeah, and there's there's passport services. There's stuff on uh, how to get your gold out. There's all sorts of different things. And I think the uh, even the discussion on your uh, blog, which is totally free, is totally worth uh, checking out. It's worth people's time to go over there and read that for sure. Yeah, the blog's great. All right, thanks for being with us. I I'm, I'm, I also enjoy getting your newsletter, Jeff. I. I yeah, you're also our first second guest, like I was on on Anarchast. So thanks so much for coming back. Yeah. on. <laughs> and, uh, hopefully, pleasure, guys. and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Maybe when we're in Mexico together. <laughs> yeah, right, thanks for the call. All right, folks. Uh, real quick, contact information for us here at Patriots Lament. Dave. Patriotslament.blogspot.com is the website, and Patriotslament at gmail.com is the email, and the uh, YouTube channel is Radio Free Fairbanks. All right, and we will be back again next week at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning for the Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. Health Talk is next. <laughs>